right. Well, Kufar Akbar, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Cross and Crescent Discussion Group. We are a live stream to YouTube live stream show that streams every Monday at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and we are dedicated to rightly dividing the truth between Christianity and Islam. And we stream from the cavernous cave, Kafir Cave, from Dar al Harb, Kafiristan. And it is bright and sunny here today. Welcome. I appreciate everybody coming to the show and sticking around for the show today. Today I have uh, uh, an augmented, this, this show, today's show is to augment a stream that I did with Lloyd DeJong on Saturday, which will be finished up tomorrow, if that makes any sense. We started a stream on Saturday that dealt with uh, the evidence, the evidence, all of the evidence that exists for Mecca in the seventh century. And we are going to, we didn't finish it up. So we're going to finish it up tomorrow. One of the things that kept coming up in his chat was the, you know, the objections, you know, what are the objections to uh, Mecca, you know, Diodorus and, you know, the, 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 the temple that all of the Arabs go to, Ptolemy and Macaroba. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at uh, what the historians, the ancient historians, the most popular ancient historians had to say about Mecca. And I know we could probably end this show right now because they didn't say diddly squat about it. But what I want to do is I want to show you who these people were that provided a commentary on Mecca or at, at least the, that region and illustrate or illuminate the fact that nobody, nobody mentioned it. And it isn't just them. It's, I mean, if you watch, if you watch the show from Saturday and what I finish up tomorrow, folks, it isn't just the historians that wrote prior to the seventh century. We were talking, we're, we're talking about things that you would expect to find in a civilization. Archaeology, number one. Um, you would expect to find uh, people from around surrounding cities, from surrounding empires, sur civilizations, commenting upon it. You would expect to find it in or on a map. And it's supposed to be along a major trade route. And guess what? It's not along a major trade route. And that's what that's what all these things I illustrate um, on uh, Lloyd's show. So if you get a chance, jump over there um, and give a like, give a subscribe uh, to Lloyd if you haven't already. Um, and some of the information that he brings up during the show is just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, a lot of the stuff, I'm going to say a lot of it. But, well, I will say a lot of it. A lot of the things that he was bringing up, I had no idea about. And they make all the all the sense in the world. Okay, so uh, is everybody ready? Look at that Donald Duck. No, the Donald Trump Duck icon. Only Darcy would would do that. And I'm not sure. Sharon's not here tonight. She said that she was feeling uh, a little under the weather. And yes, Rob, Rob, this, this is what Rob is. I mean, this, and this is simple. Exactly. Rob, this is, this is so simple where there is no water. There is no food. You can't have food where there's no food. There are no people. Where there are no people, there are no cities. Where there are no cities, there's no civilizations. Where there's no civilizations, there's no religion. Mecca gets 4.3 inches of rainfall a year. Scrub or sagebrush has a hard time hanging on for life there, let alone, you know, food that would, you know, you would be able to provide to animals to graze or to, you know, sheep to get milk or whatever, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not there folks, but yeah, it's, it goes in a, uh, sequ 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 what is it? What's the word? A sequestive? No, a sequence. It goes in a sequence, a sequestive order. Is that a word? Paul, help me out here. Help me out. Is that a word? Sequestive? No. Sequential. Sequential. Sequ <laughs> I knew that didn't sound right. You moron. Yeah, sequential. 
I'm losing it. All right. Uh, okay, so let's just jump over to uh, the information that we're going to be providing today. Uh, let me get this set up. I should have had it. I should have had it set up. I did have it set up, but I had too many windows open. You know, how you get like fifty windows open on your on your computer, and you don't want to monkey around with them, and you're afraid you're going to shut down the wrong window. And I do it all the time on this show. It gets me in trouble. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the problems that we have with Ptolemy's Macaroba. Now, the reason why we go with Ptolemy's Macaroba, and I labeled it this, is because the most often cited example of somebody mentioning Mecca prior to the 7th century is Ptolemy. Ptolemy is a uh, Greek Roman uh, curator who uh, ran the Alexandrian Library in Alexandria, Egypt in the first and second century. And by drawing on all the major works that he had, he places this a city, an unknown, a, a, a city unbeknownst to people prior to this in Arabia. And it's called Makaroba. And people are going like, oh, Makaroba, like the Macarena and Mecca. It all sounds so close. Makaroba, Mecca. And then it actually snowballed into a 16th or 17th century historian, English historian. It's kind of like this garbage in, garbage out thing where he said, well, this Makaraba, Makaroba, that Ptolemy uh, cited is Mecca. So people started running with this because everybody's thinking, well, you know, nobody mentions Mecca before and we know it was there. Why? Because, you know, millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of Muslims at this time anyway, believe that Islam, you know, it, it started in Mecca. So that must be it. And people started going with it. Well, now that people are analyzing it and looking through it, they're saying, no, 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 it's not true. There's no way it could be true. And that is what we're going to be looking at today. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Lloyd has a channel that all the Kafirs need to follow. All the Kufar need to follow that channel. And I agree. And we did talk about the Zamzam well. We're going to be talking more about the Zamzam well. That we're going to, it's, this show starts at 1 o'clock tomorrow, folks. So if you get over at 1 o'clock, we'll, it's one of the main things that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow is the Zamzam well. And, it's that is 1 o'clock Central Time, 12 o'clock noon for Eastern. No, 2 o'clock Eastern. 2 o'clock Eastern. Okay, that's going to be Come on, different. Paul. What are you trying to do? Trip people yeah. up intentionally here? I, I've been in Central Time and I've been kind of confused. And I just, I'm only back a couple of weeks. <laughs> Give me okay. a break. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. So let's uh, jump over to this. I got to sneeze before we. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, here we go. Ptolemy's Makaraba. So if, now if you look at uh, just this map, we notice that Medina, Medina is an ancient city. Medina, uh, it used to be called Yathrib, I believe. It was Yathrib. And before that, it was something else. Can't remember. Doesn't matter. But Medina has a history that predates the 7th century. As far as I yeah, know, it was Yathrib. It was Yathrib before. Yeah, it's not an ancient city, though, but it does predate uh, the seventh century, and they have evidence of that. And it was on a trade route that ran along the uh, plateau here uh, in Western Arabia. Now, if you look down here where Mecca is located, that is south and a little bit west. It's uh, this map is a little uh, over exaggerated, but it is south and it is a little bit west of Medina. But when you look where Ptolemy places it on his map uh, in describing its location, it is south and east, not south and west. So Ptolemy's location is uh, is is not Makaraba. Plus, you have other people that we're going to talk about today showing you that the, the word itself is not even close to Mecca if you look at uh, the Arabic, uh, this information that I have for today's class, <laughs> class presentation, sorry, I feel like I'm a teacher again, uh, it comes from uh, Dr. J. Smith's fi uh, 504 Origins class that he teaches out at, I'm having a brain fart. What is the name of that school, Paul? Uh, 
Sorry, it doesn't matter. Veritas. There you go, Veritas. Veritas. There we go. Okay. Dan Gibson's Nabatea, not .net, plus chronic geography, plus uh, early Islamic Qiblas, plus the other book, his most recent book, uh, that uh, Ptolemy lived. This question's in the chat. Ptolemy lived in the late first, early second century. So we're talking around like uh, 90 to 150 uh, AD. So quite a, uh, quite a few hundred years before um, uh, Islam. And then this guy right here, Dr. Rafa Amari, in Islam in Light of History, his book, a lot of that, a lot of the information for this comes from his book and also a paper that he had written. Okay, so when we look at history itself, and this is what I like to do, I like to draw a contrast of what we're talking about. When we look at history itself, we have all kinds of archeological uh, evidence for the existence of the Roman Empire, from you know, the Colosseum to uh, you know, these tile baths that they had to you know, you know, buildings outside of Rome itself throughout the empire. We can say, okay, they, we knew that this, that this, uh, the Roman Empire existed. Um, same thing with the Egyptian Empire, with uh, the pyramids and Avaris. This is Avaris up in northern uh, Egypt. The Greek Empire. We have all kinds of ancient artifacts from the Greek Empire uh, demonstrating its existence in the 4th and 5th centuries BC. Um, we have chi uh, artifacts from the Chinese Empire, from the Peruvian Empire, uh, from the Babylonian Empire. That's me, by the way skinny guy um, from the Babylonian Empire uh, and Nineveh when we go to Nineveh you find stories from the, the Bible Sargon the second was re, uh, the leader of the Assyrian Empire that carried off uh, the uh, the the northern tribes of Israel you have Sennacherib who laid siege to to Jerusalem uh, during the time of Hezekiah it's me again uh, here's this is Sennacherib's palace. This is, this is the picture I took. I took this picture here. So I've seen these things firsthand. These things exist and they're verifiable, demonstrable today. Now, why is this important? Why do I bring this up? Number one, because there's no inf inf there's no evidence outside of Islamic sources for the existence of Mecca in the seventh century. Nothing outside of whoops, sorry outside of Islamic sources for the existence of Mecca in the seventh century. There is nothing, nothing, nothing. If there is something, please, by all means, uh, uh, share it with me. I would love to, you know, you can email me, ericthekefer at gmail.com. Oh, also, also, I want, I want to mention, if you want a copy of this, pair, uh, the, of this PowerPoint, email me and I'll send it to you. I'm not a hog. It doesn't take take me long at all to put PowerPoints together. I don't mind sharing them with people if you're going to use them. Uh, make sure you use attribution, though. That's It's always unprofessional. Anyway, uh, let's see here. When we look at uh, Mecca, there's no archaeological evidence for Mecca. And the first archaeological find, the or the, the latest archaeological find that they have for Mecca is dated to the 12th century, or the earliest. Let me, let me rephrase that, the 12th century. The 12th century. That's 500 years, folks, removed. Um, there's no manuscript evidence for the existence of Mecca. Nobody mentions it prior to the 7th century. Nobody in Mecca or anything from Mecca or the surrounding areas from of Mecca mention the existence of Mecca prior to the 7th century. Um, there's no geographical evidence, meaning that there's nothing on a, uh, when we look at uh, Dan Gibson's chronic geography. It does not match. And I talk about that extensively in the, the PowerPoint or the presentation that I did on Lloyd's show, talking about how the, the Quran, the Hadith literature, the Sirah, all these things, they talk about Mecca being in a parallel valley. It's not. It talks about um, uh, Mecca having grass, trees, uh, olive trees. Well, that uh, sounds like Petra. Soil. What's that? That sounds like Petra. It it sounds exactly like Petra. None of these things are in Mecca, and we can prove it. All you have to do is just dig down and start digging through the soil and analyzing the soil. If they had olive trees at any time in Mecca, 
at any time, you would find spores or seeds from these olive trees in the soil. And when you'd start digging in the soil, your only thing you're doing is digging through sand and rock. So there, and okay, I'm, I'm going to get away from that, but there's the geograph, the geography does not match up. And then lastly, there's no cartological evidence, meaning that there's no evidence from any maps until the year 900 AD for Mecca. There's nothing there. Um, so when we look at um, why Mecca is important, because this is supposed to be the place where Adam and Eve were cast down from heaven. Notice Adam and Eve were in heaven. They weren't created on the earth. They, so this is another thing that Islam gets gets wrong. What's going in my book? Um, this is where Abraham and Ishmael supposedly rebuilt the Kaaba in 2000 BC. And I was talking to Ed about this at the beginning of the show. Even if you don't believe in a literal Adam and Eve, and that's fine. If you want to say that, you know, I'm not saying it's fine, but I'm just saying if that's the way that you want to roll with, uh, you know, placing some sort of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some type of, uh, not theological. What's the word I'm looking for? Allegorical. Allegorical meaning to Genesis 1 through 11. That's cool. Go ahead and do that. But but when we start talking about historical, the Bible treats Abraham as a historical person, and so does Islam. Islam treats Abraham as a historical person. So if you want to look at the historical aspect of Ishmael and Abraham rebuilding the Kaaba, you're talking about an event that supposedly occurred around 1900 to 2000 BC. That puts the, the Mecca at being a city that is supposed to be 4,000 years old. That's why that's important. The Quran is saying that Mecca is at a minimum 4,000 years old. You had to have, you have to have found something there to demonstrate something that existed for 4,000 years for Pete's sake. It's called the mother of all cities. Uh, it's a place where you had previous pagan religion. This is where supposedly Muhammad uh, began his prophethood, was uh, at the Hira cave. Uh, this is where you have hundreds of prophets are supposed to be buried there. Um, and this is where you have 1.6, 1.8, billion, however many people you want to say, bow towards five times a day. Um, this is where you have to visit once in your lifetime and do the Hajj, folks. The Mecca is essential. If Mecca did not exist, Islam falls apart completely. And this is why I absolutely love this, inf this information that we go through here. Not because I want to break Muslims' hearts or I want to, you know, destroy their faith. That's not, that's not my goal here. My goal is to have people turn to Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is. And Islam describes Jesus Christ as being nothing but a silly little prophet, not the son of God, not the savior of the world. And so if you can show that Islam is false, there you go. Uh, all right, let's go to the next one. Archaeological, cartological, cartological geographical manuscript evidence from Mecca prior to the seventh century. There it is. It's all right there. Go ahead and read it. Can you read that for me? Anybody? Uh, I, uh, totally I blank. Get... Totally blank. I, I don't see anything. Uh, maybe it's too small for me to see. I, I, yeah, I, I, I went in and I looked for it. You know, what I did do on that other slideshow is I went in and I asked uh, chat GGP. Can, can you uh, provide me the evidence for the existence of Mecca in the seventh century? And the chat GGP starts off with there's an abundance of evidence for the existence of Mecca in the seventh century. All of the the, the Quran mentions Mecca, the the Hadith literature mentions Mecca, the Sirah mentions Mecca. There's all kinds of archaeological evidence for Mecca. Uh, there's topographical. Okay, so I said I went in and I typed after they said archaeological evidence. I said, can you list what archaeological evidence supports the existence of Mecca in seventh century? And then it comes back and says, this is after it says there's an abundance of evidence for it. It comes back and says they do not allow archaeological archaeology to be practiced within Mecca itself. But there's plenty of evidence outside of it. I'm thinking this, 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 this that doesn't these, make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't. And the, I don't I was going to I brought it up on, on Lloyd's show. And it doesn't. I don't know. 
Okay. Uh, yes, you're exactly right, Rob. It's redacted back from the 8th, eighth, ninth centuries, mainly the ninth century. Okay, uh, let's jump back to this Hamajama. There we go. All right, Islamic claims. This is what Islamic awareness says about Mecca, the existence of Mecca. Now, folks, this is an article from Islamic awareness. Islamic awareness, if you're not aware of the awareness, this is the leading website that provides an apologetic for Islam and defends Islam against the charges of the Kufar. Here's what they said about uh, Ptolemy. It's interesting to know that Claudius Ptolemy of Alexandria, a mathematician, astronomer, uh, flourishing about a century after Pliny, undertook to make an atlas of the habitable world. He was not a descriptive geographer, and his book was intended to be no more than a commentary on his maps. He enumerated some 114 cities or villages in Arabia Felix, which is Central Arabia. For example, and then he provides a list here. And then he starts talking about inscriptions on temples. We This is the, uh, the Lactophia of Stephen of Byzantium, the Yathrib of the early, so he mentions those cities. Uh, but notice it doesn't say anything about Mecca. It doesn't, in its a defense of this, it doesn't mention anything about Mecca. So when we look at who Claudius uh, Ptolemy was, that was asked in uh, chat, who was he? He was a Greek. Uh, well, actually, he was the curator for the uh, library in Alexandria. The Library of Alexandria was the Western civilizations, Western civilizations hub for maintaining all of these great writings from uh, Socrates to Plato to Aristotle, you know, all of these great ancient writings. And he was the curator of this. And so being the curator, he would have access to all of these, all of these writings and be able to put together an idea of what the entire world looked like. So he puts together using meridian lines, uh, a round earth. And in doing so, he is called the cart cartographer uh, by making maps. Um, he lived in Alexandria. Okay, well, I talked about that already. And oh, by the way, the Alexandria Library was bu burned by the Caliph Umar, if you believe that anyway, uh, in 638. Uh, and his justification for this was if anything in there agrees with the Quran, we already have the Quran, so we don't need it. If anything in there disagrees with the Quran, well, then it needs to be burned because it it's wrong. That was his justification. They hey, used, Eric, what's the problem with that, with what we're supposed to teach children? Uh, having an open mind, be looking at different points. They of view. tell us to teach that the Muslims preserve the knowledge. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 They're supposed to be the preserve, you know, the preservers and maintainers of ancient civilizations. It's a bunch of bunk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's not. It, and, you know, when I when I think about that, it just just chafes my. Well, I, you know, the number one, there's no there. Nobody outside of Islamic literature mentions i don't I know if you guys are aware of this abu bakar umar uthman or ali nobody mentions them so when umar supposedly went storming through jerusalem in 638 establishes the pact of umar goes into alexandria evidently nobody nobody thought to write it down and maintain any of these writings and saying hey these people are attacking us they called them uh Hagarines after the line of Hagar. They call them Saracens after you know people who uh you know Sarah was sent out. That's so all of these names that they were given, they're not called Muslims, and nobody in particular, to include Muhammad, is mentioned by these people, or a Quran for that matter. I'm sure people are aware of that. Um, let's see. He was the head of the library there. Okay. There it is. I was, uh, wrong. Well, no, he was born in the first century, but he was the head of the library for, uh, 23 years here. And so therefore he would have access to all of these maps, to all of these writings by all of these, uh, 
uh, ancient writers and explorers uh, that lived prior to that. And okay, and he was instrumental in meridian mapping. Mapping already wrote that, and he wrote a guide to geography. And this, he did this over six years, and it came in uh, several different volumes, if I'm not mistaken. And so he is the one that calls the city Makaroba, which people are claiming to be Mecca um, today, which Islamic apologists claim. But if you look on this map right here, let's see here. Here is this right here is um, Yathrib. This right here is the. This is the city. The name of the city is Lath Latharipa, prior to being called Yathrib, then being called uh, Medina. And right here is the Makaroba, our Makaraba. Mecca is over here, folks. Medina, Mecca, Makaraba. So this is not. This is not the same city. This is where Mecca, uh, Mecca is supposed to be when we look at it uh, on a map, on Tal Ptolemy's map, because these are all the different locations that he mentions uh, on his map. Hey, Eric, have you ever heard of a city just getting up, you know, picking up its skirts and running down, you know, what, what are you talking about, 50 miles, 100 miles? Uh, it could if they were being attacked um, and if they had a good transportation system, maybe if they took the train. Um, they but a whole able. city gets just picking up and running. I mean, well, I, I understand. I mean, they're tent people, but again, why would you? Place. This is this is this this is the thing about Mecca. If you look right, if you look at a series of cities here, and this is what I cover in that uh, presentation that I did on Lloyd's channel, it'll show you a series of cities all along the plateau here. Me a lot of people don't realize this. Mecca, in order, to, uh, Mecca is not on the plateau. Mecca is 3,000 feet off of the plateau, meaning that you have to travel down to Mecca to a place that has no water, no grass, no food, no people, no, I mean, they have none of these things. And then if it's some other all cities, you have to travel back up 3,000 feet, back up on the plateau to continue on this route. It makes zero sense, zero sense, for people to go to Mecca, that there's there's no reason for people to go to Mecca. And so when you start talking about moving a city there, why would you move a city there to begin with? There's nothing. There's there's no way to survive there. Okay, get me all riled up. Stop. Okay, a couple well, more facts. One other thing. On the other side of the Red Sea is where all the shipping docks were. Yes. Yes, and we have, and that's and that's that's an important point, Ed, because what you can by by knowing that. Let me go back to that map. Number one, and this is what where the people have said, well, why would you take goods off of a ship and then uh, load them onto camels and then walk them across a, a land route when you could just keep them on a ship and sail them up the Red Sea? That's number one, but number two. There are no ancient ports along the eastern seaboard of Arabia here. None. All of those ancient ports are along the African coast. And it's about a, what, six-day jaunt up there, five or six-day jaunt. And all of these ports that are on the, on the eastern side of the African coast here are supported by archaeological evidence that date back to, um, I think, B.C., the first or second centuries yeah. B.C. So, you know, you don't have any evidence of ports over here um, anywhere near that time for a time period, and they're all over here. Why in the heck are you even thinking about having this on a trade route right through here? Why are you even coming? Why are, would you even think about coming 3,000 feet down and then back up? into a desolate valley. It makes zero sense. And that's that's one of the main things that uh, Jay brings up during his presentation. Okay, Makaraba is not mentioned prior to the second century anywhere. That's that's one of the points. If you say Makaraba is Mecca, nobody mentions it anywhere prior to the second century. So let's just pretend this is what Pliny is talking about. 
why hadn't somebody mentioned it if a city that's a mother of all cities that has existed since 4000 bc and so that time it would be what 2700 years old 2600 years old why not bring that up at a minimum that old why not bring that up there's no nobody knows why now there was a city and this is what lloyd brought up in the presentation so if you want to jump over to lloyd's channel after tonight's show is over of course if you want to jump over to Lloyd's channel, there's a there's a city called Makrib, um, near Medina, that, and he says that it deals with the calling of a certain god or something like that, which they think might be an illusion. I don't know. You'd have to go back to his show and, and, and watch that. Um, again, Makarab is east, Medina, or Makarab is east, Medina is west of uh, Me of uh, Medina. Uh, and also Ptolemy describes it as being in the fifth of a series of six cities down towards Yemen. And a lot of people think that it's in Yemen, not in Arabia. <coughs> or Oman, there we go, sorry. Or Pliny mentions it, Makaraba, which is in Oman. And it never appears again on any classical survey. This is the only time, the one and only time Makaraba ever appears on any map or survey. And when we look at the uh, previous ones, they, like I just said, they don't, they don't mention. So let's take a look at a couple other civilizations and see how they compare. When you look at Jerusalem, does Jerusalem have physical evidence that supports its existence dating back clear to the 11th century BC? Yes, it does. And the more that they dig in and around Jerusalem, the more evidence they find for it. Nobody doubts the, the, the writings of the Jewish writers, uh, writers when they're describing places like Mar Mount Carmel or, Carmel or when they're describing uh, the Dead Sea area when David's fleeing Saul or when they're describing the Galilee. Nobody doubts that. Um, they don't doubt the, 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 the antiquity of the 15th century uh, return of the Hebrews into their land after a exodus. Uh, during the Exodus, the geography, um, and when we look at Luke, Luke mentions 110 different places in his gospel, or 100, he names 110 locations in his one gospel where the Quran lists 65. Follow this, folks. I think I have it in here. Let's, let's, I, I, if I don't have it in here, remind me to, 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 to mention that. Um, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great lived in the fourth century BC. Uh, he sanctioned one of his naval uh, commodores, captains, or whatever to go out and uh, explore the Arabian Peninsula in and around it. Um, he's supposed to go on the entire coastline of it. This includes the Red Sea. And he says there's no inhabitants, cities, or harbors to give anchorage for his fleet. Where? the Arabian Peninsula along the Red Sea. This is where you would find, you would expect to find Joppa, which is the port city that supplies Mecca. It was not there. So this corroborates the later Greek writings that state that the region itself is uninhabitable. You can't, you cannot grow anything there. You cannot, people cannot live there. Why? You have no water. You have no water. You have no food. You have no food. You have no people. You have no people. You have no cities. You have no cities. You have no civilization. You have no civilization. You have no Islam, period. One of the first writers uh, that explored there was uh, Theophrastus, um, and he wrote in the 4th century BC on the geography of Ra uh, Arabia. He talked about the Sabians, which were up, uh, the Sabians were south, I'm sorry, in the southern part of it. Wrote about their trade, their land, their marine routes, described it in detail, described the region in detail, and never once mentions a location named Mecca. So this demonstrates that Mecca was not part of the, the Arabian trade in the fourth century as insisted upon by Muslims today. So he was also a writer who specializes in details, and he, he left this detail out of this Mother of all cities, this one detail? No, think not. Um, let's see, Erat, uh, how do you say this? Eratosthenes? Eratosthenes? Eratosthenes. Thank you. 
All right. Well, his survey. So he lives. I don't know. In, Eratosthenes, I believe. There you go. That's right. Eratosthenes. There you go. That's that's exactly that's you're right. That's how you. I've I've actually looked and state how to pronounce these names. I've gone into one of those. I don't know. I don't know. You type in the word and they, they pronounce them. I have to do that every week for Usama Shell. It's frustrating. There you go. <laughs> Eratosthenes. Yes, he lives in the third, second, and third centuries uh, BC, and he also documents the geography of Arabia. And they're doing this because they want to control the spice trade um, coming from India uh, to Yemen. And he measures the length of the Red Sea along the West Coast because you need to know how long it takes to say to uh, uh, to sail up the Red Sea. And he provides a, a survey of all of the marine routes between Yemen and the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, the Gulf of Aqaba is where you get to the northern part of the Red Sea. It splits into two. You have the Gulf of Suez that goes westward and the Gulf of Aqaba that goes eastward that continues to run along Arabia, the Arabian uh, Peninsula. Um, And he, again, describes all the people he encounters there, locations of the region. And he says that the region where Mecca is, is uninhabitable. Why? Because there's no water. You don't have any water. You don't have any uh, food. You don't have any food. You don't have any people. You don't have any people. You don't have any cities, no cities, no civilization, no civilization, no Islam. Um, He doesn't describe any villages. Why? Because there weren't any. That's why he doesn't describe them. Uh, There's no other uh, explorers prior to him that described this. And again, if this was supposed to be a a, a place for a pilgrimage, where's the evidence for this? Where are people riding on rocks on their on their trip to uh, on their trip to uh, Mecca? You know, we're going we're making this annual pilgrim or this great pilgrimage to uh, our ancient city, yada, yada, yada. You would think that they would write that on there. Also, by the way, go ahead. One thing I'd like to mention here, uh, have we not seen in the past few Hodges where people have uh, passed out or died from heat exhaustion and uh, uh, thirst, yeah, lack of water? Yeah, this this year specifically, there's, I think there's like a thousand people who died. Yeah, so... How is it that there's not this long graveyard back and forth from uh, on for the pilgrimage to Mecca for all these centuries? Why, why, why aren't we not seeing that? Exactly. Yeah, great point. What? Where is it? Where are these? Where are these? These routes? These paths that these people took? Where are the inscriptions on the rocks that they would have? You know. Let's take a break. It's it's a it, it's got up to 127. <laughs> I wanted to get yeah. down a cool 112 before we move out again. So when you're sitting in the shade, you're going to scratch on the rock, saying, "Man, it's hot, but we're going to get the macro." You know, you would you would write something, uh, but yeah. yeah, and the wild animals, you know, just wow. Yeah, it's incredible. I need to take this off. I. Had my watch on all night last night. Yeah, That's part crazy. about wild animals makes me laugh because it that section in Sharia on hunting, like where are you going to find them <laughs> if you're living around Mecca? Where are you going to find those wild animals? Yeah, there's yeah. Well, you might find a couple of lizards, I guess, but I don't know what else you would find. Okay, so uh, Erastenes does not mention Mecca. Why? Because it's not there. Um, and this, you know, when we start talking about um following the land route uh if this is supposed to like like, like i just said if this this city is supposed to be two thousand years old at this time over two thousand years old at this time you know it's game over you you have to have something there and the fact is is that they have nothing nothing uh this is uh the map of the world that uh Eresthenes, um Drew, and again, this is the third century BC. It's really crude, but this is what uh, they believe the world looked like. And they're semi close. You know, they overemphasize, of course, the size of the Mediterranean. Um, but look how big Arabia is. You know, they, they get Arabia pretty close. They don't go as far south with uh, Africa as they should, but okay. 
Agatharthes. Agatharthes survey is one of the most popular ones. Um, he lived in Alexandria, Egypt in the second and third centuries, and he is supposed to be the most important uh, geographer of this time. Um, he had, uh, had a lot of association with the royalty, the ruling class there in Egypt, the kings, and um, they tapped him because of his knowledge of the Red Sea. Um, and he had access to all of the writings of all the prior uh, geographers, just, just as uh, Ptolemy did. So all, everything that existed prior to that, he had access to it. And he classifies a lot of these people as being eyewitnesses. And this is important to know that Ptolemy was not an eyewitness. Ptolemy never set foot in Arabia. So he's just going off of what people had written about. Agatharthes is different, and he's using the writings of people who were actually eye, eyewitnesses. I'm not saying that Ptolemy didn't, but Ptolemy was, you know, there's a difference between putting boots on the ground and uh, chiming in with your opinions. Um, let's see here. The expeditions um, that were conducted in the 7th and 8th centuries confirmed his writings, and he also provides measurements along the Red Sea because of their trying to uh, uh, establish trade. There it is. The links of the trade routes were, were important. He mentions the Nabataeans in uh, Jordan, and he also lists all kinds of other places along the Red Sea to include temples. And this is important because temples were very important to the Greeks. So wherever there was a temple, they would they would mark it down. So if the Kaaba, if I mean, if you had a Kaaba in Mecca uh, at this time, it would have been listed. And it's not uh, there. I just got yeah, it was a great interest of the Greeks. And he lists all the other tribes that are in around the Red Sea, but does not mention Mecca or the Koresh tribe. And he, the, uh, let's see, it, Mecca would have been a great interest to this Greek writer. Why? Because it's supposed to have this Kaaba, which is supposed to be the center for uh, worship for all of these people that were making um uh, making Hajj there. And again, he is another one that turns around and says this place is uninhabitable. You can't, nobody can live there. Why? Because there's no water. No water, no food, no food, no people, no people. You know, it's just, it's easy, it's easy to understand. Okay. Theodorus' temple. This is another one that's often used by Muslims as an excuse for uh, showing that, there, that the, the Kaaba existed. Um, he's a uh, Greek historian who writes in the first century BC. Um, he writes a 40 book um, history of that region. And he wrote of a temple that all Arabs came to honor and worship in. So here, of course, Muslims are going to go, well, that, that's the Kaaba. Everybody in Arabia at this time Went to the Kaaba to, to worship, to honor that place and to worship there. Well, the problem is the temple that is described by Diodorus is the land, is in the land of uh, the Banazamnes. Zamanes, I can't pronounce that. And this, again, is in northern Arabia around the Gulf of Aqaba. If you go, here's the Red Sea and here is the Gulf of Aqaba up here. And this is the Gulf of Suez. The Banzanine, right there, Benzamnes, whatever they're called, lived right here. Mecca is down here. There's a 600 mile difference. This is a huge difference, folks. Okay, uh, let's see the well known temple because of the number of caravans that came from the interior. And they said that. Muhammad worshipped at a temple during his invasions of Tabuk, which is in northern Arabia. So this might be that temple that they're talking about. And again, this location is confirmed by Agatharthides and also by the Byzantine ambassador in 530 AD. But nobody mentions, nobody mentions in Diodorus' writings, he does not mention Mecca. So here you have the Gulf of Aqaba. Down here, you have Mecca. That's a huge difference, folks. It's 600 miles. Um, Artemidia, our Artemidorus' survey, again, this is uh, 
103 BC, he includes, again, more geographers, his personal observations with the uh, people along the Red Sea. He talks about all kinds of uninhabited islands themselves along the coast. Um, and he makes it clear, folks, this that the area where Mecca is was uninhabited in 103 BC. So this throws out this notion that Abraham helped Ishmael or Ishmael helped Abraham rebuild the Kaaba in uh, 1900 BC. It was uninhabited. Nothing was there. Strabo. Now, this is probably the best one right here. Strabo, he's a Roman geographer. Folks, you might want to write this guy's names down. Strabo. He's a Roman geographer, and he travels with a, uh, a, a Roman general, Gallus. Now, Gallus is sent from Egypt down the Arabian coast to Yemen to conquer the Yemenese people. And along the way, along the way, they are starving Marvins. Um, it was, uh, they're on, okay, they're on, okay, and they go from the Red Sea, and they go 100 miles inland into Arabia itself. And let's see, three stations are mentioned as part of this route. Okay, now, the army is needing supplies along the way. They would, and what I mean by supplies, folks, this army is starving. They need food. So any village, hamlet, city, whatever is going to is going to be noted and uh, explored, so these people can get some food. Somebody, somebody, somewhere in that area would have mentioned Mecca to Strabo's army or to Gallus's army. And Strabo would have been able to record it. But nobody thinks to mention Mecca. So you have, you know, uh, so, somebody like Dio Cassius. He even even talks about how how terrible this this expedition was for Gallus because the men were uh, going through uh, starvation, privation during the expedition. So they were desperate in their scavenging for food for the army. And he also mentions other geographers in the uh, that. Uh, went through the area and none of them mentioned Mecca. And he mentioned, and he does write down all these other known villages in around Mecca today. So all of those villages that we know existed at this time and at the time that Mecca is supposed to have existed, we, he makes note of those, but he does not make note of, ne of Mecca. And the reason why he did not make note of, note of Mecca is because it did not exist and this is the route thank you this is the route that he took so he would have gone right by mecca he would have talked to people in and around mecca he would have talked to cities all the towns and villages along the way nobody mentions mecca okay this um Parapolis of the Arethian Sea. This is a book that um, is supposed to be the most reliable historical document on the trade routes um, and, and around of Arabia. It's written in the first century, and we don't know who wrote it, but it, it's really irrelevant because of its accuracy. It is it's a very accurate book. Uh, the guy who did write it lives in a place that is uh, in northern northwestern Arabia along the Red Sea. I think it's even along the Gulf of Aqua, if I'm not mistaken. And he, they think he's Greek and that traveled along the regions as far uh, eastward as, of, uh, as, as India. And he was very, very familiar in his writings of the central track of Arabia. And the accuracy of the book is corroborated by other geographical and historical evidence that are the evidences that are um, mentioned there. And he talks about cities that existed hundreds of miles from the, the Red Sea shoreline. He talks about cities that uh, were also of little of importance. He mentions names of the kings and tribes that lived along there. He talks in detail about uh, the region surrounding Mecca. But what does it say right here? He does not mention Mecca. 
Now, this is a city that at this time had supposedly existed for 2,000 years, but yet going through uh, providing a meticulous description of the western coast of Arabia, western part of Arabia, Mecca does not get a mention. And I think this is the last one, folks, is Pliny's survey. Uh, he, there is Pliny the Younger, who is who we know to be famous for mentioning um, the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, his father, Pliny the Elder, uh, lived up until 79 AD. He writes uh, natural history. And um, he's known to have written the most important books that contributed to Roman life and their times. He describes 92 tribes in Arabia and nations. Uh, he does not mention any of the tribes which Islamic tradition claims to have lived in Mecca. He doesn't talk about the Quraysh. Well, why is that? What was the, who knows? Does anybody know what the other tribe in Mecca was? Um, does anybody know that off the top of your head, either in chat or here in the panel? I can't remember. Yeah, it, yeah, I can't remember it either. It's it's not important, but it, it, they're not mentioned, so it doesn't really make a bit of difference. They're not mentioned either. Um, but he does mention sixty nine cities and villages in Arabia, but fails to mention Mecca. Now, we this writing is important because it covers all of the regions of Arabia at that time, and. Here was he was so detailed that he mentioned tribes that occupied the desert Arabia, but does not mention any tribe around Mecca. So he mentions all kinds of other tribes, but he does not mention the Quraysh or the, any other tribe in and around Mecca. And here's the thing to know: he Pliny does not mention Mecca, despite all of his writings about all kinds of other locations that are even insignificant to the mother compared to the mother of all cities. So, what is the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is, is number one, Ptolemy does not mention Mecca. Uh, he places Makaraba, which is uh, east of Medina, which it should be west. Uh, all of Hallelujah. Um, you play <laughs> he, all of the people who are your most trusted and authoritative writers talk about all kinds of other places that are known to have existed at that time, but none of them mention or allude to Mecca. Um, these writings are that, that were developed are meant to establish rule over people, trade routes, um, to wage war. I mean, it's, they were important. And nobody, everybody, everybody, everybody fails to mention Mecca. And then lastly, which I think is most important, is there's no archaeological evidence supporting uh, Mecca in the 7th century. Okay, and all evidence Mecca appears to have been redacted back on the Islamic standard, Islamic narrative. So if you want a copy of that, folks, uh, you can go ahead and email me. Let me type my email address into the chat here. Does anybody have any thoughts on that that they want to? Yeah, I do. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Who is this, Nico? I just want to say. Oh, Brad. Right. This is Brad. Hey, Rad. Okay, listen to that. That actually has to be what I. It's true Islamophobia at its finest. <laughs> I mean, seriously, how can you say that Mecca did not exist? I mean, yeah. that, don't you understand that everything that you just said proves Mecca existed? The fact that there's no archaeological evidence is because Allah protected it. You see? He protected it from the Kafir. You know, I could see some sort of, and to be honest with you, I could see that some sort of apologetic could be uh, developed based on that idea that mm -hmm. Mecca is supposed to be this important city. This is why he <laughs> all these Kafirs that would dare to, you know, come down their coastline, exp you know, exploring, going inland and looking around, that he protected the site of Mecca uh, from them. But there's there's so many different, so many problems with that with that idea. That it's 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 disgusting. You just, I mean, well, that, there again, you're asking for the soup. You're invoking the supernatural in a well, world that is dependent upon natural evidences. 
again, it's just a miracle, you know, that they protected, it, kept it invisible. You know, just like the Quran that is corrupt but not corrupt, it's a miracle because it contained different variants. He preserved all of it, it's a miracle. You know, every, everything's a miracle one of the Quran. Scientific miracles that don't exist. Do you know Neil Armstrong heard the call to prayer on the moon and he discovered the crack in the moon and he became a Muslim? Do you know that? Yep, it's true. I heard, I heard that one, yeah. And now no, it's coming up. I, a little funny note here. I was listening, I think it was over the weekend. I don't know. For some reason, I, I clicked on one of the, I was looking through the videos on the channel, and it was when we had Hatoon on. And Hatoon, let's see, there was Hatoon. I was, of course, I was on there. Chris Claus was on there. Um, you were on, you you had come come on there. Kenny Bomer was on there, and um, who's the guy from Australia? Rob, Rob, uh, Rob Krishna, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and he was on there, and uh, Kenny made the comment, or I was going to say, "Well, I'll bring up uh, Robert Rells, or he's going to have some questions for you." And Kenny's like, "Robert is a disgusting person. I would never talk to him." And that guy from Australia, Robert from Australia, is like. <laughs> what are you talking about? He thought he was talking about him. This devil, uh, 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 Robert Wells, this devil, yeah. Uh, uh, Robert. Yeah, that guy. You know, what's funny about, you know what's funny about this? Honestly, I have no idea why Kenny hates me so much. I mean, honestly. I come on, Red. No. Come on. I wouldn't do anything to him. I'm perfectly innocent. I'm not. But, Hey, I think you were actually pretty friendly with him. You came on his um, transphobic oh. uh, episode, remember? Yeah. I ran the show on him. But, uh, <laughs> he dropped off his own show. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it. Uh, no, 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 seriously. I mean, no, yes, I, I know that getting you know, all his personal information and stuff, blah, blah, blah. But he hated me long before that. I only had that one brief interaction with him on Facebook. Okay, where I, I, he's like, do you know who I am? And I, I was just speaking, so I wouldn't you know, even type in, in the first verse. I'm Kenny Bomar, the author of the book, Consider Islam, leading the propagandist of AIDS. And I'm like, he's okay, a, so I was like, doc, I mean, he's a doctoral student, too. At the yeah, time. yeah, he was a doctoral student, too, yes. Yeah. Freshman so doctoral went, went, student. I go to look for the book, and I'm like, dude, am I spelling your name right? Did you call the question under, you know, Nam de Plume? You know, because I can't find it on Amazon. He's like, the book isn't published yet. I said I'm the author of the book. I didn't say anything about publishing it. And I'm like, well, it's kind of misleading. Should you get it published? You know, you start saying, no, if you take any of the classes I'm writing, they always tell you to promote yourself. And I'm like, okay. And he says he's a doctorate student. And I swear he said Michigan University. So I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm like, well, what's your thesis or whatever? So I say, well, I haven't got my bachelor's degree yet, but I'm a doctorate student. I'm like, dude. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And that's and that was what I was. Uh, that's what I was. What, what, what got him so? Remember that part that where he hits his hits the desk uh, in the intro. Oh yeah, that was with uh, Stan Davis. Told him that I go. I don't believe that you went to uh, uh, Michigan, Mishka. It's Mishka it's University, of Michigan. It's Mishka, and he does, he does pronounce it. He does pronounce it, Mishka. But it's it's hard to understand. Um, the Sentinel is what he went by. Rob, Rob, the Sentinel something. That's I, I went I went back and tried to find who it was. But when he said, you know, I, I hate Robert Wells or, or I hate or whatever. He says, oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So he 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 was like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm a scumbag. You've never dealt with me before. Give me a chance. You know, I might, I might, you know, hit your mark, but. Yeah, anyway, he was. That was. Oh. And, and there's a link right there to uh, a little while back when uh, Kenny was doing his uh, live show where. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Somebody went on there and burned the Quran while his show was going on. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, I remember. Who was that? Uh, we're not going to. That mention. was funny. I remember seeing that. We're not <laughs> going to mention who. 
It wasn't me. Uh, no, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. Let me see here. The way Mao Duty interprets this passage, <laughs> oh, sorry. what it's saying is this. It's right here. The people of the book need to accept the messenger if what he says confirms the scripture. If the scripture is lost, as you say it is, <clears throat> if the scripture is corrupt, if they don't have it anymore, then they cannot know whether the messenger confirms the scripture. That's the objection. Does it make sense, Kenny? It, it, it makes sense, but you, I think you're, you're conflating a couple of different issues here. Okay, for one, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Quran is coming to confirm <laughs> what Allah originally did. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, it has been tampered with. I mean, scholarship proves that it's been did tampered with. Did he even notice it? So, but that's not what the Quran what, says. Did he even notice it? Oh, he does. Uh, Kenny doesn't, but uh, what uh, somebody else does. referring to is referring to what was originally given to these people, and that's not including what's been tampered with. So it's it's. And is what he's doing. The final messenger of our of our creator. And is what he's, he's doing. doing. It's totally different. Please see, see what this Christian is doing, running the Quran in front of you. He's he's doing, wow, wow, wow. Look, this, this is this is the <laughs> this is recorded, right? Yeah, so this is recorded. Look at that. This is recorded, guys. This is a live recording now. Look, he's burning the Quran. Uh, who is that telling him that? Is that that little he jazz or uh, I think is who it was? Yeah, that, that little gremlin looking guy. Uh, yeah, I remember I remember seeing that. I did, I couldn't remember whether Kenny noticed it or I, I um, yeah. You know, and I'm not I'm not a book burner type guy, but uh, when you and I had my pastor remember that there was the guy from Florida. Terry yeah, he Trump. called he Who called uh, Usama and wanted him to come down and uh, be there when he burned the Quran. And Usama says, "No, I want people to read it so they can find out what the enemy wants." Yeah, didn't that, that guy like buy like like ten or twenty thousand Qurans? And he yeah. had him on a flatbed semi-trailer truck, and they pulled him over because he was going to have a huge bonfire of Qurans. And they're like, no, you can't do that. Isn't that the guy? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember, whole... yeah I, remember, I remember the incidents, but I can't remember exactly all the all the details. I remember oh, that. The last time we had, we had a flatbed semi-truck, and it was stacked high with Qurans, and he was going to take it. They're going to build this big bonfire. And the cops pulled them over and they're like, no, you don't have a permit to build a fire. Yeah. And well, there's like, I think there's a church. Wasn't there a church that got vandalized over this? Oh, I'm some... sure. Yeah, I can't remember all the the details that, that went on with that. But I was I was saying I had a I had a my, one of my pastors, uh the pastor at the time asked me about are you for uh burning the Quran? And I told him, I said, you know, I am but only only and i and i'm and i'm not for burning to insult people but by burning the quran what it does is it illuminates how shallow this faith system really is it illuminates the behavior of these people when they feel they have been are you going paul i yeah i have to go i got i just got an important call <laughs> sorry <laughs> all right we'll see you there. <laughs> Or is your show Thursday? He left. Uh, Eric, I wanted to add one thing. Did you know yeah. that that's the only proper way Islamically to dispose of anything Arabic is by burning it? It's really wild. These Muslims are super ignorant. They, they don't even know that that's the only way that you can actually dispose of this material is by burning it. You're supposed to burn it. You yeah, can't yeah. It You're not supposed to put it in the trash heap. or what, what, I, I, I understand. Well, look, yeah, but that's but the do it, way to do it. <laughs> the way that the way that they were burning it though was meant to offend them and if you if somebody went out and burned let's say an american flag i'm going to be offended i i am i admit that but i am not going to go out and start killing people over it i'm not going to start killing the people who are burning it because they have a right to do that i don't believe that that's 
enumerated in the Constitution, but according to current law, it is, and you have to obey the laws of the land. So I'm not going to hurt those. So, but what they the, the difference is is that those people that burn the crime, they are attacked physically, and the people who are attacking them physically, their defense is, well, I'm offended. Well, you know what? Everybody gets offended. That does not give you the right to go out and attack people because other people, and you like the CISA because they have the, the right to express themselves. They have the right to, you know, free speech. So they're, they're the religion of perpetual offended. Yeah, I, I actually 100% agree. Perpetual pleasure. Yeah, I, I agree to freedom. I think that's a value that we have. And you're right. It's like if someone burns a flag, then they're being a jerk. They're being dumb. I'm like. You're, you're burning a flag of a country that's giving freedom to all these people that's giving you freedom being here that, that that's not really very smart and i'm like if you really value something you know if someone really values the quran or any holy scripture to themselves you know you'd be like okay i don't really like what they're doing write an op-ed like that's what civilized people do write an op-ed write something uh, write a, a journal um that is actually really true that's kind of interesting that uthman uh, burn the other manuscripts, but it's like, um, I think you should just write an article. You know, I think like, you know, for example, they did wrote the, the Salman Rushdie wrote the satanic verses. I'm like, read the satanic verses and write an op-ed on it. No one read it. Nobody even knows what the book's about. It's the most wild thing. It's a fictional story about two, about a Bollywood actor. That's like a Indian Hollywood actor. And I'm like, it, it's ridiculous. I, I just don't get these people. I'm sorry. Well, they definitely have views. I wanted to ask Ed. Ed, do you know why the individual that did burn the, the Quran there burned it? Do you have any idea why that happened? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, because it's a wicked, evil religion. <laughs> and that that book has no place in society whatsoever okay. the the rulings that it gives for you know like quran 9 5 the verse of the sword mm -hmm. which commands all muslims to kill all non-muslims yeah uh he he despises that book almost as much as i do okay i didn't know if it was you know, it was to get a rise out of the people that were. Oh, yeah, it, it was definitely, you know, geared for that as well. But he was also practicing his constitutional rights to show that uh, Islam has no place in America. And it surely has no place uh, trying to supersede our Constitution. Yeah. Um, and one of the an ideas for some writing that I wanted to get into deals with that that idea right there where um it's muhammad becomes the supplanter everything that christ was he tries to become in islam so everything that christ was in the christian faith in islam you find muhammad and all of you know you so you have yeah. this supplantation of all of these ideas instead of having christ now you have muhammad yeah muhammad is the Islamic God. I don't care what anybody says. You can rag out Allah all day long. They don't care. But you say one bad thing about Muhammad and gloves are off. Yeah. Let yeah. Me, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, let me add to on, on the back of both of those things. Um, it's a canon of the church um, to only dispose of things, sacred items, through burning. Kind of maybe as a continued Judaic tradition of uh, burnt offering type of thing. So just, yeah, on the back of what you're saying, it's, it's quite common for cults to commandeer or to supplant or, or to uh, hijack ideas and practices to validate their own fabrications. So we, yeah, we do find that a lot. Uh, Muhammad steal all kinds of Christian traditions and even things that are canonical in Christianity. Yeah. Well, and, uh, and by doing this, and this, and this is what why, this is why I do the show is because by doing this, he condemns people's souls to hell. By trying to supplant Jesus Christ, by trying to supplant the, the the Son of God as the Savior and somebody whose behaviors that we should emulate or follow their sooner, that's 
that's that's why I do this show is because he's le- he's leading people to hell is what he's what he's essentially doing. Okay, uh, I don't have anything else tonight, guys. I don't know if anybody has anything that they want to add. You guys been following what's happening in the UK? I've seen. Well, I've been following it because you've been sending me. Oh, that's getting pretty up. Yeah, it's all these clips on uh, Twitter. We're gonna, put, we're gonna put Tommy Robinson in prison for life, I bet. What about Tommy? They say, Tommy <laughs> Robinson is saying, they're saying he's the mastermind. He's the one behind it, behind the scenes, promoting this, uh, um, you know, organizing it, and while he's in Cyprus on vacation. England is lost. I, you know, who were we talking to? Maybe it was somebody on um, Lloyd's show the other day. I'm like, England is it's just they're lost, you know. Until the, and this is this was was brought up is that th- there's going to be a violent civil war in order to keep this from happening, in, in order to keep from losing number one their culture and supplanting it with Islam. There's there's there it's it's to the point now where there has to be violence. I'm not calling for it. Never would. But it is so entrenched into their society that the only way to remove this hatred, this visceral hatred that people have for, and this, think about this: these people are supposed to be uh, uh, England. You know, they're, what do we call them? Brits. They're supposed to be Brits themselves, and they hate their country. If you hate the country, leave, dude. Get out. Go back to that whatever you came from. Or your parents came, or whatever. Get out. No, or- that's not what they want to do. They want to, uh, and I keep saying this, Islam is the Borg. They're there to assimilate. They are the Borg. I don't care what anybody says. That is the Borg religion. Parasites. Uh, yeah. yeah but they're... I- they're um- and also, what's happening now, it looks like um, the Muslims are out on the street. They're calling themselves the Muslim Defense League, and they're brandishing weapons. They actually have this BBC um, broadcaster out there, and um, they're getting threatened. They had their tires, oh, Sky News, they had their tires slashed um, by these um, angry Muslims. They're stopping um, people in cars and checking if they're white. If they're white, they either get beat up or their tires slashed. Um, yeah, dude, it's getting really nasty. And of course, the police are doing nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're letting it happen. Except if you're except if you're a non-Muslim UK British citizen um, and are peacefully protesting, then they will arrest you and knock and beat you and throw you in jail for a very long time. Uh, it's it's really getting bad. Me, somebody sent I can't remember who it was. I mean, I'm I'm going through my let's see here, going through my Facebook. I looked in Skype. It wasn't on Skype, but somebody sent me a video of a Muslim acting like he was going to throw a brick through a window. And I can't remember who did that. Um, Was it on Facebook that was sent? Where did I get that? Good night. Uh, Wasn't an email. Was it on? It wasn't. Was it in Skype? Maybe it was in Skype. Let me see here. No. No. No, it wasn't. I, can't. I don't know. It came from somebody. Was it in private chat here? No. Oh, what are you looking for? It was a... Um, what is this, Nico? What are we doing here? Mahomo. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I'm sorry. I should have warned you. Um, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. As you can see, it's quite uh, controversial. You can you want to watch it before you show it if you want to show it. It's uh, something I show on my own channel, but I, I do a lot of crazy stuff on my own channel, so I don't I don't want to subject you to that. Uh, okay. Uh, what's it, what's it from? What is it from? It's a uh, it's a little game of uh, where's Waldo. It's a uh, it's kind of like uh, kind of I presented that. You know, we had a Hitler sighting in, in Brazil and, you know, and that kind of thing. And so can you spot where Muhammad is uh, in this scene type of thing? 
Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, you'll skip it. All right. No problem. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. We'll, we'll keep that on the download. I'm trying to find this doggone. Maybe it was Darcy. Darcy, did you send me something? Is Darcy still here? No. You didn't send it. Somebody sent it to me. Maybe it was Dominic. No. Was it in the chat? It wasn't. In, I don't think it was in the chat. Um, it was of a guy, and it was on. It was on Facebook for crying out loud. And you would think that I would be able to find it on the Facebook. Let me. Life shouldn't be this hard. Shouldn't be this complicated. Um, no, no, that was from Ed. You find it after the stream's over. That's how that works. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly when I'm going to find it, it'll be right there, standing right in front of my face. Oh, wait a second. Um, no, it'll be right there in front of my face. I don't know what happened to it, but if somebody sent me where where it showed a Muslim that he was going to throw a, a brick through a church window and he turns around and says I know y'all want to think that this is what we're going to do and what we want to do to your and you know you want to portray us in a, in a violent light well dude you don't have to throw a brick through a church window in order to portray what your people are doing your fellow co-religionists are doing over there in England in a violent light they're doing a pretty good job of it themselves so that was, that's, that was the point that I was going to make on that I guess it wasn't that important. All right, guys, I'm going to call it a night. Um, I know this getting out of here a little bit early is is not the norm. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has any ideas for next week's show. If you do, email me at Eric Thekafer, Eric the Kaffer at gmail.com. And I'm always open to, you know, discussing different ideas, new ideas. You know, an idea that I would like to discuss and have one of you present is the correlation between uh, Revelation and and Mecca itself. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not beneath begging somebody to do that for two and a half years. But, um, Ed, if you want to ever want to get around to doing that. <laughs> I will give you the opportunity to do it. Uh, you just let me know, brother. Uh, but the rest of you that were in chat today, again, thank you, everybody, for coming. I saw that um, Avery was live, had a 1,000 views or viewers. And I'm saying, I'm saying, well, everybody's over watching him. When they get done, they'll come over here and watch me. Well, he was he was still live. Uh, but uh, and everybody that you know sits on the panel, every I, I always appreciate and value your, your opinions. Um, and what you contribute to the show. God bless y'all. And we will see you next Monday on the cross and the crescent. Oh, this please keep you. everybody in London and England, our brethren in your prayers. Yes. Brother Dominic over in London too. Yeah. So that's why he's not appearing. Yeah, there was a, uh, it was Bob the builder. And there was another fella that Lloyd knew that they were looking for new apartments, new places to leave their leases or that place is just, I don't know. God bless them. And, uh, keep them in your prayers so they can uh, have some resolution to all these problems they're having. All right. We'll see you all next week. God bless. Advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that the Muslims were riding against one another. And as much as we don't want to face the fact, the Muslims were lying sometimes. They were fabricating, they were embellishing, and that might be hard to accept, but that is a reality.